I'd like to call on Reverend David Mook at this time to come and give us greetings from the American Council of Christian Churches. Brother Mook. Thank you, Pastor Spencer, for the opportunity to just bring a brief word from the American Council uh, that I'm privileged to serve as president. It is an honor for me and my wife to be here in this place. It's so rich with the history of the preaching of the gospel and the defense of the cause of the gospel. And so I'm glad to be here today and to bring to you greetings from all of our affiliated denominations uh, in the American Council, as well as some uh, individual churches and a number of individual members. Uh, you don't have to belong to a church to join the American Council. You can apply, and as long as you can agree to our statement of faith and our standards, then you can be received as a member of the American Council. I think it's always good to be reminded as to the purpose of the Council, and from our website, this purpose that was stated at the very beginning in 1941, nearly 77 years ago now, we read that the American Council of Christian Churches is a fundamental, multi-denominational organization whose purposes are to provide information, encouragement, and assistance to Bible-believing churches, fellowships, and individuals, to preserve our Christian heritage through exposure of, opposition to, and separation from doctrinal impurity and compromise in current religious trends and movements, to protect churches from religious and political restrictions, subtle or obvious, that would hinder their ministries for God, and to promote obedience to the inerrant word of God. The Council of Christian Churches, the American Council, is not a denomination. Uh, we do not send out missionaries or start churches. We exist for the encouragement of those who stand for Christ. And may I say that we certainly appreciate the offer of this church to host our 77th annual convention this October, October 23rd to 25th here. And we look forward to that time, look forward to seeing you again in those meetings from Tuesday evening through Thursday evening. We look forward to that time, and we want to thank uh, Pastor Spencer for all that he is doing in the preparations uh, to help in getting ready for that convention. Trust that the Lord will bless you and continue to honor the ministry of his word in this place. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Praise God. It's a wonderful ministry, the American Council of Christian Churches, and we encourage you to be with us during those meetings in October. Please make your plans now. If you need to take some vacation time, I know you'll be blessed to hear the various speakers, the various breakout sessions, or the wonderful meals that we'll be having together. Uh, please do join us in October uh, for those meetings. You'll see more about that in the bulletins in the days that lie ahead if the Lord tarries. Now please take your Bibles and turn back with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 15, the passage that I read just a few moments ago. We're looking at Israel and the wilderness wanderings. We've been looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God during those wilderness wanderings. The ten, ten evil times of temptation where they rose up against God. And we finished rebellion test number four at Rephidim, which taught us many lessons about prayer and spiritual warfare. We saw that God says that Satan and his followers, both angelic and demonic and human, are decadent, defiled, and perversely evil. They're not ignorant of what is good. All those people around you in the world that seem so nice, they are under the control of the devil. They are not good. They have deliberately chosen to rebel against God and his moral standards and his divinely revealed order of holiness. 
And in this war, there are only two options. Either you are engaged in the fight, or you are being deceived and lulled to sleep by the devil until he can destroy you. We looked at the key verses in 1 John. The Bible makes it clear that the entire world and the entire world system is evil and under the control of Satan, the evil one. 1 John 5, 18 and 19, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one, that Satan, toucheth him not. Verse 19, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Point of Ross. I pointed out that immediately following that warning about the wicked one and the whole world lying in wickedness, that the very last verse, just a few verses later in 1 John, warns against idolatry. And that's fascinating because the very next test that Israel will face in the wilderness wanderings is the test of idolatry, the golden calf. So as you begin to parallel what's happening in the New Testament, you see many reflections back to what happened in the Old Testament, and the warnings against the sins that we see in the New Testament are actually reminders of the sins into which Israel fell in the Old Testament and for which they were judged. And those things were written for examples for us today. We find that four times stated in the New Testament. Verse 21 says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Unfortunately, believers can have internal wickedness that is worthy of death, just like Israel did in the Old Testament. We saw that over in 1 Corinthians 5, there are six specific sins that are listed. Fornication, covetousness, idolatry, drunkenness, and extortion. And it says, if anybody is one of these things, if a man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? <laughs> the pagans. <laughs> them that are without, God judgeth. But them, therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. In other words, throw them out of the church, pray that God will use the devil to kill them. The New Testament teaches about the ten failures of Israel and the other examples given in the Old Testament. It says, with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. God killed them. Some people think there were two million Jews who came out of Egypt. I think the total is probably higher than that. 600,000 men are mentioned, but you can't expect that they only had 1.5 children apiece. I suspect they're closer to six million. And only two, Joshua and Caleb, out of that entire group that left Egypt made it into the promised land, those of age 20 and over. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Verse 7, and here we have it, neither be ye idolaters. The golden calf failure is listed next. As were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now I ask commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Are you involved in fornication? It's one of the reasons God killed the Jews in the wilderness. Are you involved in fornication? Oh, I'm not just talking about physical, though. If that's true, beware, God may kill you. Are you involved in pornography? Are you involved in looking at a woman or a man with lust? She says, you've committed adultery in your heart already. These are serious issues, people. God has called us to be a holy people. Paul goes on to, with examples of wickedness. He says, now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Peter tells us the same thing. And he uses homosexuality, sodomy. Homosexuality is a clinical term. Sodomy, wicked, evil sin, as one of the three prime examples, 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6. If God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Example number one, angels. Example number two, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Example number three, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow. Get the last phrase. Those are your three examples. 
making them an example unto those that should after live ungodly. America, are you listening? This country that was founded on the word of God has now turned aside and is living like Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboyim. To make sure we don't miss the point, we find it in the epistle of Jude, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. America, are you listening? Is there someone in this church that's not listening? That brought us to rebellion test number five, which was at Horeb, the golden calf in Exodus 32. We all tend to think of this as the big one, but all ten of these failures, uh, those points of rebellion, are what nailed the coffin of Israel closed in the wilderness deaths. And we were reading here in Exodus 32 now, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we not not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons, so to remind you of what's going on in America today with the boys wearing gold earrings, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. Then they rose up early on the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to plate. We just read about that in 1 Corinthians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf. They have worshipped it and sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. No, may I harvest them, and that I may consume them, and I will make thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, Fa mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath. Repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. As we have moved into this study of the golden calf, the first thing that we learned about the test deals with the issue of impatience. We tend to jump to the conclusion which is the golden calf. But there is a sin that led to the making of the golden calf. They would never have made the golden calf if it were not for this sin, the sin of impatience. Verse 1, remember? And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, that man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. People are like this in every age, you know. 
They demand action. They demand feel-good entertainment. That characterizes the modern neo-evangelical and charismatic churches today. They want their rock music and their worship bands. They do not want holiness or sound preaching. They want their strobe lights and they want their fog machines. They want gyrating buys and feel-good experiences. They really don't care about leadership that has taken a courageous stand against the pharaohs of this world. They're the now generation. They get impatient when leadership makes them wait. They get impatient with leadership that seeks the face of God as Moses did. Oh, how many recognize intellectually what leader has done? It's the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. But they really don't care. It's like that's nothing. They don't have to be grateful at all. They really don't care what happened to the man of God. Just as long as they get what they want. That's true in churches today, too. They're ready to desert him in a heartbeat if they think somebody else can give them something that they can see and enjoy better. Somebody who tickles their innards and gives them the jollies and the wiggles. As they did with Aaron, they're willing to commission somebody else to make it up as you go along rather than waiting for God to reveal himself. They hate the thought of patience because it may be uncomfortable. They don't want to wait. They want results now. The Bible has a lot to say about patience because this is one of the primary tests that Israel failed. I said last week that there are some of you in this church that are very impatient. Remember, one of the key wilderness tests was on the issue of patience. God killed people because they were impatient. They rushed ahead with their own carnal plans while pretending to worship God. Last week we started looking at the gigantic number of verses in the Bible that deal with the issue of patience. I think most of us before that probably never realized how much the Bible has to say on that subject. But God says a lot about patience because it's one of the primary tests that his people have failed in every age. For example, Eve didn't want to wait to ask Adam if she should eat the fruit. Noah didn't wait, want to wait to have a good shot of liquor after he got off the ark. Abraham couldn't wait for God to fulfill his promise through Sarah, so he grabbed Hagar. Moses couldn't wait for God to fulfill his promise to deliver Israel from Egypt, so he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Hope you get the picture. Impatience always gets you into trouble, and it always gets you out of the center of the will of God. A few of the things that we've already looked at include patience is necessary for obedience and fruit bearing, Luke 8, 15. Patience is necessary for spiritual stability, Luke 21, 19. Patience is developed by responding properly to hard times, Romans 5, verses 3 and 4. Patience is developed when we walk by faith, Romans 8, 25. Let me just read it again for you. I know. Some of you weren't here last week. We went over each of these verses last week. But if we hope for that, we see not. Then do we with patience wait for it. The walk of faith. Patience is developed by study of the promises of the Bible. Chapter 15, verse 4 of Romans. For whatsoever things were written for time were written for our learning. That's all these things that we're studying in the Old Testament. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Patience and encouragement produce Christian unity instead of division. Romans 15, 5, Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Patience and suffering is one of the proofs of a divine call to the Christian ministry. 2 Corinthians 6, 4, But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Ecclesiastes tells us two things about patience. Number one, patience is in it for the long haul. And two, patience, tied to the consideration of others, is the opposite of pride, which is based on self. Ecclesiastes 7, 8, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Patience has the eternal perspective, not the temporal perspective. Romans 2, 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Patience is one, of the, one part of the trinity as to how a Christian can survive in the world. Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. 
Patience is one of the four keys to dealing with Christians who are having trouble. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Number four, be patient toward all men. Patience is one of the two keys of having a right attitude toward God. 2 Thessalonians 3, 5, And the Lord direct your hearts unto the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Patience is the key visible manifestation of self-control in multiple areas. 1 Timothy 3, 3, Patience is one of the most important requirements for church leaders. 2 Timothy 2, 24, The servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto my man, all men, apt to teach, patient, Patience is an essential character quality to develop if the Lord tarries his coming. James 5, 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold the husband who waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Verse 8. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Patience is the only way to keep God focused so that you don't get frustrated by the wicked. Psalm 37, verse 7, and Psalm 40. Verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear unto me and heard my cry. Last week, I told you that I hope that you're getting the idea that patience is absolutely essential in the Christian life, and the Bible has a lot to say about it. Impatience always leads to bolting outside of the will of God and landing in carnal sin like Israel did with the golden calf. Patience means that you not only refrain from your natural impulses, but that you examine each option to see if it fits with biblical principles. It was impatience that moved the Jews, listen carefully, it was impatience that moved the Jews to build the golden calf. And that's one of the ten principal reasons God killed Israel in the wilderness. Okay, that moves us today onto the issue of, well, isn't patience really sort of related to sloth? And the answer is no. Some people think that being patient is being slothful. There are people who want to be proactive. They want to keep the cart moving. They don't want to stop. They hate to sit quietly and wait for God to work. I mean, he lives in eternity. How long is this going to take? Now, it's true that some slothful people pretend that they're being patient when really they're just being lazy. They disengage their minds. They recline their bodies. They put on a wise and knowing look on their face and tell activists to take it easy. It'll all work out in the end. Don't get all upset. But genuine patience is not sloth for two reasons. And the Bible states both of those reasons. Number one, because the Bible sets patience in contrast to sloth. And number two, patience must be exercised by faith in order to obtain the promises of God. Without faith, no promises. Without patience, no promises. Patient endurance is absolutely necessary to experience the blessings and the promises of God. Now, that may be the reason that some of you have never experienced God's blessings as promised, promises, because you are not patient. Let's look at the verses that contrast sloth and patience and glue patience to faith. Patience and sloth are not the same thing. There are people who want you to believe that, and that's why they want to keep moving forward. But they're not the same thing. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. If you've got your Bibles, follow along with me, rather than just sitting there with a blazed stare and thinking, I wonder what verses he read. We're in Ephesians chapter, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 12. Look at the contrast first between sloth and patience. Hebrews 6, 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through, and here are the two things, faith and patience, inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham... Because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiply I will multiply thee. And so, after he, that is Abraham, had patiently endured, patiently endured 
he obtained the promise. Sloth and patience are not the same thing. They're set in contrast. We find that patience is going through the tough time. Sloth is avoiding the tough time. Patience is waiting on God, regardless of what the enemy throws at you. Sloth is saying, let's compromise here, let's compromise there, let's compromise here, let's compromise there. Let's relax and not get in the way. Let's not make too many waves. Those are not the same thing. And secondly, it's glued to patience. Who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You know, it's interesting that God always uses suffering to develop patience. But we're carnal. We are not to avoid suffering instead of growing. Because as God brings the fires of affliction into the lives of the believer, it is designed to burn off the dross, to burn away the slag, to burn away the trash and garbage in our lives so that in the end there is a refiner's pot filled with pure gold and the goldsmith can see his reflection in the clear gold without any blemishes in it. That's why God brings affliction into the life of the believer because he's conforming us to the image of Christ so that we will reflect him in his beauty and in his glory. Yes, God uses suffering to develop patience. We try to avoid it, but that keeps us from growing. First Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now we move to the second thing that we learn from the golden calf. The golden calf test deals with compromising secondary leadership. Compromising secondary leadership. You know all that kind of leadership that takes their marching orders from the congregation rather than standing up to the congregational pressure and providing real leadership. Here's Aaron, he's secondary leadership. Congregation says, this is what we want. He wiggles and shakes in his boots and sweats a little bit. Thinks, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Real leadership waits for the direction of God. Real leadership is not afraid to tell the congregation to wait. But look at Aaron the wimp. This is not leadership. Verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, he's been thinking fast on this one, break off the golden earrings that are in the ears of your wives and of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Now that, you know folks, <laughs> look at that, say, that is a truly absurd compromise. The New Testament talks about apostates tickling the itching ears of the compromising church. The responsibility of biblical leadership is to fight intensely against apostasy in the light of eternity. We see those things tied together in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. So we're looking forward to the future. What are you supposed to do? If you really believe Jesus is coming back, John tells us every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Here's Paul talking to Timothy. Christ is coming back. So what are you supposed to do? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, repute, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's a pretty big order. I don't see anything about compromising in here. I was sitting and dialoguing uh, with them and trying to work out something where we can both agree. Preach the word. If it's not in here, you don't preach it. Be instant in season. Out of season. Reprove. Rebuke. Ooh, those are negative words, aren't they? You know, a lot of people call fundamentalists negative. No, we're obeying what God said because you must either challenge sin or compromise with sin. There's no neutral ground. You can't float through life. 
reprove, rebuke, exhort. And you hang in there while you're doing it with all long suffering. With all long suffering and doctrine. You don't just sit there and think, well, maybe someday they'll stop. Maybe someday they'll stop. It says, and doctrine. You are teaching systematic truth. Look at verse 3. For the time will come. It's not, well, it might happen. You know, some down the road. Well, you know, I see that's a possibility. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Note also how Aaron told the men, oh, this horrified me when I thought about it. Aaron told the men to lead their own families into wickedness. Did you see that? Men, you are accountable for the leadership that you give to your families, whether it's righteous or evil. The wives and the children followed the leadership of their fathers. He said, I want you to take those earrings off your wives, and I want you to take the earrings off your sons, and I want you to take the earrings off your daughters. He was talking to the men. And the men did it. Because the men's hearts leaned to a false God. And their wives and children followed in fact, they actively participated because we don't read about any wife saying, no, I'm not going to give you my earrings. I don't believe whatever he's going to do with them is going to be God. Men, we are accountable for the leadership that we give to our families. Note also, each person involved in this only had to make a little bit of a sacrifice. All they were giving up was an earring or two to get a really big benefit. Why, just think, for only a pair of earrings, they were going to get a god. Wow, what a deal. That's one really cheap god. And it's a God that's going to give them everything they want. And I mean, is this cool or what? It's going to be a God that they can see and feel and have fun with. Why, it will be just like the gods of Egypt. And they, they remember how great and powerful Egypt was. Of course, they're tending to forget what God did to the gods of Egypt. In fact, it's going to be a God who never tells them that what they're doing is bad. It'll be a tolerant God. It will be a God that accepts orgy worship. Hey, doesn't that sound great? It'll be a God that lets them have all the carnal fun that they want and still feel good about themselves at the end of the day. The problem is, it is not the God that led them out of Egypt. Instead, it's a God that pulls them back into Egypt. Never forget, the responsibility of biblical leadership is to fight intensely against the apostasy in light of eternity. The responsibility of biblical leadership is to stand firmly against falling back into loving the present world. Loving the present world, I believe, is one of the great sins of the charismatic new evangelical and modern church growth movements. What does Paul tell Timothy? Here's how you're to deport yourself in ministry. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. The, the law says, well, you know, I'm going to pretend to be patient, but what I'm really doing is I'm trying to avoid trouble. I just sort of creep off into the background and lie back and recline on my couch and let everything happen. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Paul says, I'm standing at the door of death right now. I've handed it to you. Don't drop the torch. 
carry on to the next generation. For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have compromised a good compromise all the way through life. I've had a really floating, smooth, easy time. That's not what he says, is it? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But sorry about the rest of you, you're not going to get one. It's just me. That's not what he says, is it? He's reminding Timothy of the responsibilities of leadership and what you're supposed to pass on to your people. What you're supposed to pass on to the next generation. Hanging it, the torch, from one generation to the next. As a runner passes out of life, he hands it to the next man. And he runs through the darkness and through the animals and through the torrents and through the hail and through the birds of prey that are attacking his head. As he climbs the mountain, as he goes across the prairies in the blazing heat, as he runs through the frigid ice, passing it from generation to generation to generation to generation. And the bandits are in the way and the apostates are there with their bows and arrows and ready to hit you and kill you if they can. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Timothy, here's the torch. Are you willing to take it? Are you ready to take it? Do you know what your responsibility is? Watching in all things and doing afflictions, doing the work of an evangelist, making full proof of your ministry? I have kept the fight. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And listen to the next five words. And not to me only. You say, yeah, but it was only for the apostles and really, really those, those first century Christians. Right? No. Look at what it says. But unto all them also that love his appearing. Why do we do it? Yes, we have the foundation of the past, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But we also have the hope of the future. The appearing of Jesus. Remember what I said, First John tells us? Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Paul knew Jesus was coming again. Paul knew the blessed hope. Paul understood that someday he would stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, and give an account for the things done in this body, whether good or bad. Not to get saved. But he wanted the crown. Who through faith and patience receive the promises. It's for you. It's for me. Unto all them also that love his appearance. Do the diligence to come shortly unto me. Now listen to verse 10. Because this is where the modern American church has gone astray. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. What does John tell us? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth, abideth forever, forever. Junk on earth passes away. You can collect it if you want. You're throwing away pearls, diamonds, rubies emeralds, eternal rewards that last forever. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. Oh, 
we pray by your mercy and grace, you will keep us from loving the things of earth. We're so worried about our temporal comforts. We're so impatient to get what we want now that we're willing to throw it all away. We're so impatient that we're willing to accept second best. We're so impatient that we don't want to stand for what is true and righteous and just and holy. We're so impatient we don't want to wait upon God. Forgive us, Father, for we have sinned. And as we confess our sin, we know that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we pray that you will take your word and apply it to our hearts this day. Transform us by your spirit and by the word of God that we might more perfectly reflect the beautiful image of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 316, O Sick and Head Now Wounded, number 316, we'll stand to sing.